conflict is fundamental for reaching innovative ideas and innovative solutions. This is the Talent Show, a new podcast series from FT Talent, a hub of innovation from the Financial Times, hosted by under 30s for the under 30s around the world. This first series is in partnership with Bocconi University, a leading higher education institution of business and managerial advancements. I am Virginia Stagni, and this is the guide you need to drive innovation and change. Today, we are focusing on leadership by talking with an expert who studies the art of managing teams built to succeed, even in our high-intensity and complicated world. This is for any listener who wants to become a better leader, build stronger connections, and better understand the value of community. Here is our conversation with Massimo Magni, professor of leadership and of managing people in organizations at Bocconi University. Ciao Massimo, how are you doing today? Ciao Virginia, everything is fine here and thanks for inviting me over. It's a pleasure and we cannot wait to hear all your insights and your expertise around team management, uh, managing conflict, managing risks in a team environment. So um, with Bocconi Press, you have published a book recently, you co-author it. The name of the book is Team Management. I would love you to talk about the book in general, what topic has been interesting you and lead you, of course, to co-write this book. Thank you, Virginia. So the idea of the book starts from the fact that I always been fascinated by teams because teams are everywhere in our lives and teams represent our DNA and they are the essence of human being. We are social creatures at the end and we can find teams even where they are not supposed to be there. Think about, for example, solo sports or individual sports. We think that the individual achievement is the only achievement, but uh, behind the scene, there is a team and it's a team achievement, even if we don't see the team. I, I think that teams is uh, something that is related to discovery process or a shared discovery process in which we can uh, enjoy together and build something together. We have the team that is uh, somehow the merge of our cognitive side and our emotional and motivational side. So this is something that fascinates myself in terms of, of team management. The book from this perspective wants uh, to be a way through which we can uh, help out our readers uh, to uh, reflect about their uh, teams. There are not recipes, but there are some suggestions, some insights. There are some uh, interviews that we have done and we have conducted, so uh, we would like to provide the tools. So it's a kind of toolbox for our readers. Teams can get complicated, right? Because of um, the different backgrounds, the different personalities that they inglobate. How can leaders manage when a crisis and conflict arises within the same team? Uh, that's a very nice question. Working with companies and working with managers, sometimes I hear this kind of sentence like, Oh, Massimo, you know, in my team, everything is fine. We don't have any problems. Actually, as soon as I hear this voice, a red alarm immediately pops up in my mind. So if there is no conflict, things are not going well. It signals that things are going very bad. Why this? Because conflict is fundamental for reaching innovative ideas and innovative solutions. So we should look for a conflict, but we should be prepared to manage conflict and managing the conflict in the right way. Sometimes people are afraid about conflict, They're afraid for too many reasons. On one end, because probably they could be afraid about the fact that they are not comfortable for sharing their own ideas, their own perspective. Or on the other side, they consider and conceive conflict just as an interpersonal dynamic. And this is something we should, uh, we should avoid. I'm trying to imagine I'm a younger person and I'm trying to manage conflict even from a very early stage in my career. Maybe there are a few different standpoints with my manager, with my leadership team, and also within maybe my colleagues. What would you suggest to that early career professional Sometimes, or most of the time, we are not used to deal with conflict, even if we are in conflict since uh, kindergarten, when we play with, our, with other kids. 
but actually the thing we can do is to maintain as much as we can the focus on the object if we maintain the focus on the object it means that we can have a fierce point of what we would like to sustain but at the same time we don't lose the respect for the other person so it means that we are discussing about a certain service product choice decision but it's related to that field so we have that specific rule that is particularly important just focus on the object do not focus on the person so the person should be transparent here we talk about the servant leadership the charismatic leadership the ceo activist can you give us a bit of a mapping around the different types of leaderships and things that we can learn from maybe some key takeaways for our listeners Okay, you, you bring me outside my comfort zone, not because I, you know, I don't I know the language. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about comfort zones, I think that even in this case, definitions can encapsulate too much our uh, perspective of leadership. So, and mostly for young people, if I think about, oh, you should be a charismatic leadership, people start to force their behavior to be someone they are not. Again, it's important that you build credibility at the beginning of your career. Then your leadership style will grow with you and will be unique. It will be not charismatic. It will be not servant. It will be not uh, empowering. It will be your leadership style, something that fits with you and fits with the context, since we were speaking about the context. So, for example, if I am leading a team of senior people, it's very different in terms of behavior uh, from uh, leading a team of uh, junior people. My behaviors are different. My approach is different. I'm more empowering in the first case. I less empowering in the second case. Maybe I have a problem of motivation. I should push for more charismatic and inspirational leadership or I'm in the middle of the crisis. Probably it's very difficult to use empowering leadership. So we have to first build credibility uh, because credibility is something that uh, show other people that you fulfill the promises. And the second thing is leadership is uh, somehow to guide people. And if you want to guide people, they should trust you and they should feel that you are a credible person. Then leadership style is something that will come and it's something that will be unique for anybody of you. So my suggestion is, not worry about the leadership style, worry about building trust and building enthusiasm in these people to follow you and to follow your ideas. I think this is so important because what you touched upon here is about, first of all, being credible, being authentic. I think out of our very first part of the conversation, empathy is key because what you are mentioning here, you need to be able to adapt to the circumstances. This is um, very easy to say, very difficult to do because adaptability is something that we all have because of our uh, way of being as human beings. But at the same time, sometimes it's, uh, I believe it's a bit difficult to program it, right? So are there any uh, daily habits that you would recommend a younger talent and an early career professional to try to, to exercise every day to become a better leader? Actually, two things we have to take care of as leaders. In terms of habits, take care of your mind and your body. For your mind, learn new things above and beyond your job. So you would like to play guitar, play guitar. Uh, you would like to have a run, have a run. Would you like to have a kitchen class, do a kitchen class. It means that you have your mind that is focused on something that fulfills you. And it's something that brings you energies that the next day you can bring to work. The second is body. So take care of your body. Take a break. Rest. Ensure that you have relaxing time in your agenda. Because if you have relaxing times, it means that you are recovering your energy. And so you are more sharp in decision making. You are more sharp in taking an empathic perspective. You are more sharp in managing the relationships and managing conflict with people. 
So these are the two things I think are fundamental from a leadership perspective. So not the workaholic leader, but the leader who is able to take care of himself, herself, and as consequence, is able to take care about other people and the job he's uh, appointed to do. What would be your tip for people that are so workaholic and so in love with and passionate about their job and they start getting a bit frustrated and then maybe something that we're seeing, right? The turnover in big organizations, like, okay, something is not right, next one, because I have a great CV. Do you have any tip around that? Yes, I usually start at the beginning of my master with an assignment for them, an assignment that is a simple assignment. And I ask them to define for them success above and beyond the academic performance. Another thing we can do, even if we are not students anymore, what is success for us above and beyond our job? And it's something that helps us out to create a sense of awareness. The second part of the assignment is now everything is fine. So we are not in a tense situation. Everything is going smoothly. But think now, what are you going to do? And you should be prepared for this when things will not go as planned in your curriculum. So do not think about it when it happens. Think about it right now because you, your mind will be prepared to face this kind of pitfalls. As usually I mention them that when something goes wrong, I close myself in the kitchen and I cook for 24 hours for me, the family and friends. And it's something that I know that relaxes me and uh, gives a new start for after 24 hours. It's something that helps me out. Thank you very much, Massimo. I have one last question for you in terms of the new rise of tech leaders. There has been a recent, not really recent, but, you know, in the last decades, for sure, after digitalization, that in business, the leaders are the founders of great tech companies, most of the time amazing coders, so they come from the technical side. I think from a bit of more traditional business and academia perspective, we have always seen a bit of like leadership skills separate by the scientific technical knowledge. Have you seen like the two kind of sides of state church world coming together in the way business leaders are acting or would you keep them as two separate streams? I think that they could merge somehow or they can converge. Having a technical background could be very important and having a technical background helps a lot because it helps to understand actually what's happening around you more quickly. But this is a double-edged sword because on the other side, you can have the temptation to focus on uh, your comfort zone. So what happens is that, for example, if you are a developer, your risk is that you like so much the developer perspective that even if you take a leadership position, you continue to micromanage the technical side and you forget about uh, something that is outside your comfort zones, customers, stakeholders, relationship, marketing. So you can have the best product ever, but nobody knows about this product you are developing. Thank you very much, Massimo. And now is uh, our question time. As you know, part of a talent show, we have uh, challengers and early career professionals from all over the world coming uh, over the show and asking directly to our experts key questions. So today we have Frankie and Alexander for you, Massimo. So over to you, Frankie, with your question. Hello, my name is Frankie, and I was a participant of the FT Talent Challenge in 2022. I'm from China and the United States, but I'm currently living in Paris. I'm currently doing my master degree in fashion management. My question to Professor Massimo Magni is, it's sometimes believed that people pleasers are not necessarily the best leaders since they compromise the economic outcome in order to adapt to the feelings of the others. As a business leader, what is the best way to manage the conflict of interest between employees and the organization? Thank you and looking forward to hearing from you. 
Thank you, Frankie. Grazie for your question. Pleasing, it's a very difficult word because if we say pleasing others, it means that pleasing leaders are those who are, let's say, going the directions of the others, but at the expenses of the overall goal. Pleasing others, it means that we forget about the overall goal. We have to somehow listen others and maybe accommodate others, but in the framework of what is the organizational goal and the team goal. The good leader is a person who is able to understand this, understand what are the needs of the others, and try to frame them in the goal of the organization. If he is doing, or if he or she is able to do that, he or she is able to find a win-win situation when apparently there is conflict. So, and this is amazing if you can think about this. It's the ability to transform a potential conflict into something that please both the organization and the individual as well. Okay, think about what's happening right now in the hybrid way of working, in which we have to maintain the focus on the organizational goals, but at the same time, some needs of people changed a lot. So the ability to blend them together, it's fundamental. And leaders who are successful right now are those who are able to listen and put this into practice. Thank you very much. Massimo, and the next question is by Alexander. So over to you, Alex. Hello, my name is Alexander Berger. I was a participant of the FT Talent Challenge in 2021. I'm originally from Greece and Austria, raised in Belgium, and currently living in Luxembourg, where I'm working at KPMG. My question to Professor Massimo Magni is the following. As someone who has recently joined the workforce, I'm curious about the rising trend of remote and hybrid workplaces. How will leadership and management methods evolve to reflect the new professional environment? Thank you for sharing your expertise and knowledge on this domain, and I look very much forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Alex. That's a, a very hot and up-to-date question. Actually, most of the time, we think that managing an hybrid uh, team is the same of managing a team that is uh, on-site, but actually, it's, it's different. And those who try to use the same leverages, most of the time failed. What I'm suggesting here is to focus more on the purpose of each person within the team. Why the purpose? Because when we are working in a hybrid setting, we have two hats, two different souls. The personal soul, when we are working from home, for example, while having also the work soul or the work hat in which we are at home, but we are working. So we have this conflicting perspective between our two identities. So having or giving from a leadership perspective, a sense of purpose of how this person can help the overall goal of the company or the overall goal of the team, it's something that help to manage in a proper way, this conflicting situation. So I would work more on the soft side rather than on the hard side. Uh, because the hard side, it's not really something we can control when we are in a neighborhood format. What we can uh, work is to motivate people and engage people toward the goal we would like to reach together. Thank you very much, Massimo. Thanks to our challengers for the question. This has been very inspiring, very useful. And I think we have so much to take away even from a very pragmatic and day-to-day -day activities and habits that we can build for ourselves as employees, as leaders, of course, as humans. I really hope you enjoyed our chat today. I certainly did. Thank you very much, Virginia. I enjoyed uh, a lot and thanks for, uh, for inviting me. And I learned a lot as well. If you have any feedback around these conversations, you can reach out to us via social media at FT underscore talent. You can drop us an email at fttalent at ft.com. And thanks again to you, Professor Magni, for being with us. If you're a listener of a talent show, I bet you're quite interested in the world of work and in understanding trends that are shaking up workplaces worldwide today. I recommend you to check out Working It, the FT's workplace podcast and newsletter. Join our friend and host Isabel Berwick every Wednesday for understanding the big ideas shaping work today and the old habits we need to leave behind. Tune in, subscribe and follow. This has been The Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent Team 
Aya Al Shihabi, Noor Hafez, and me, Virginia Stani. Our podcast producer is Todd Van Luling. Our editor and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa. Our video producer is Enrique Zeca. And our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the talent show episodes at fttalent.ft.com. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time, and keep listening. Thank you.